Alright everyone, so I'm sure many of you have already heard a number of times by now that the real game changer for this next generation of consoles is the SSDs. How it can really change game design, how it opens up so much more in terms of possibilities. And that is all true, but I think it's much better as a visual to go over games from the past that better demonstrate these bottlenecks that developers have had to deal with over the years. But funnily enough, because they've been dealing with it for so long, they're very good at hiding these bottlenecks. And because of that, I think it's going to be a situation where two, three years into PS5 and Series X, plenty of people will certainly notice the fast boot times, the fast load times, the existence of no load times, but rather people might not really understand the qualitative aspect of how the design of those games has changed. So we'll talk about that as well. See, this is the thing with console generations, is that it's almost always visual. You can see just how much better your games are getting thanks to that GPU and CPU spec bump, right? I mean, your games just look so much better in terms of graphical fidelity. Developers love pushing the envelope. They love extracting the most power that they can out of these boxes. They love optimizing for these platforms, and you can see just how much better they look from the outgoing platform. But then there is certain design elements that are also pretty easy to see, like getting more memory, more RAM. That opens up a lot in terms of game design and what you can really cram into your game. And uh, something very easy to look at is Uncharted on PlayStation 3 and comparing that all the way up to Uncharted 4 on PlayStation 4. Uncharted 1, uh, the Uncharted franchise really, is a very linear game. It's point A to point B. It's a sprint. And uh, there's many sections in the Uncharted franchise where it opens up a bit, right? This is a combat room more or less where you have tons of places to take cover. You can jump onto ledges. Uh, you can, you know, look for ammo and that's kind of the firefight rooms that you often see in that franchise now from playstation 3 to playstation 4 we still had 5200 rpm drives and yet when we get to uncharted 4 on playstation 4 we're seeing rooms that are a lot larger like the scope is is massive right now the inherent design of uncharted has not changed though it is still a linear game it's chapter by chapter this is the basic makeup of the Uncharted franchise, but it's still linear. You still go from point A to point B until you get to these shootout chambers where you can have a little bit of gunplay, take your cover, jump around, but Uncharted 4 takes it to the next level with that faster memory where it is a much bigger room and they're experimenting with different gameplay mechanics like swinging, uh, swinging from the grappling hook. There's an ice pick like tool to climb walls in that game. You know, there's, there's more going on uh, and that's what you expect from a later entry in the franchise on more recent hardware with a better GPU, CPU, more RAM, faster RAM, but that's what those things can do for a game like Uncharted. But both these titles were still made with a set minimum of a 5200 RPM drive. So what can an SSD do moving forward for a game like Uncharted or all games moving forward? And it's also important to note, this is not exclusive to PlayStation 5. I mean, yes, Sony has gone with a very, very fast SSD, but it's still great news that both machines from both manufacturers are shipping with uh, these very fast NVMe SSD drives. So there's definitely going to be speed comparisons down the road, and I'm sure that'll be looked at, but both machines have the SSD, and that's the best news there, which brings us to some of the more obvious points that you've already heard a number of times and you don't think it's that great but it will be such a big quality of life improvement your games will boot a lot faster and install times will be very very minor or almost non-existent depending on the title if anything i would like to know just how fast are they going to are they going to allow it i mean we still have things like splash screens right a screen for the publisher, for the developer, for the engine. That remains to be seen, but installing the game, yeah, that's gonna be great. I mean, I just tried to install a number of games for some of the footage of this video after a lot of these games were previously deleted from my PlayStation 4. And sure enough, uh, you can start a lot of these games right away, although they're developed in such a manner where they expect you to play chapter one immediately, right? So Uncharted, for example. Uh, but usually if you try to use an existing save file after reinstalling this game and jump to a later You know a later point in the game You're gonna have to sit there and wait and hopefully this is something that will absolutely be remedied moving forward with uh, those SSDs So when we look at past games Usually loading is dealt in two different manners uh, two very common manners Let's say where you are presented with well just a traditional load screen the developer just says you know what This is how the game is made. This is how we're approaching it we're going to have to give our players some loading screens. And a lot of the times, you know, a myriad of examples where you get things on that loading screen, right? You get a character model to rotate and play around with. You get a little mini game or something that you get to engage with. 
you get a tip screen. You, you see a lot of those. I'm seeing some people say that they're going to miss tip screens on PS5 and Series X because the tip screen actually does enlighten you with some information that you otherwise probably didn't notice or check out when going through a basic tutorial of the game. The other way, of course, is that all the loading screens are hidden, as in there is no typical loading screen. Everything that's loading is all in the background, and you're not really noticing it because it's all very fluid gameplay. You're never really taken out of the action. You're never stopping, but you kind of are in an arbitrary, unseen manner where you just don't really realize that's how the game was designed. It's designed in a very purposeful manner so that there's enough given time before you get to wherever you're going that that thing that you're getting to loads before you get there. Jack 2 is a great and obvious offender of this, and I think that's why Mark Cerny used Jack 2 as his example in the Road to PS5 video, where he shows the map of Haven City. This is the city in the game. It's noble world. There's no traditional loading screens, but the game is designed in a very unique manner to make sure that everything is loaded by the time that you get to where you're trying to go to. And if you've played Jack 2 before, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you haven't. When you play Jack 2, I mean, it's not really an open world where you can just go from point A to point B in a straight line. Pretty much impossible. Jack 2 has a lot of windy roads and buildings that you have to swoop around to get to where you need to go. The map of Haven City is segmented into different, dramatically different areas, so one section looks completely different from the other, but in order to get to that part, you have to swoop around all these buildings, and you can never see over these buildings. I mean, it's very controlled. It's controlled in such a way that there's never a situation where you're so fast to where you can't get there and not see everything loaded in properly. And then there's situations where you leave Haven City entirely to see completely unique areas that don't look anything like Haven City. And sure enough, you stand in front of a door, takes, uh, you know, about 15, 20 seconds, doesn't seem all that long because you get to watch this very cool animation of the door opening very slowly but then you're presented with that entirely unique level as you leave Haven City and enter into this uh you know more exotic gameplay or more exotic environment rather but now let's compare what appears to be two very different games 2001's original Jack and Daxter to the 2018 God of War there is 17 some odd years separating these two games except they share one very big similarity they don't have loading screens, and they're principally based on not having any loading screens. Slightly different in that for Jack and Daxter, that was in its infancy. It was one of the first games to really do something like that. It was very impressive for its time, and ironically, it's still impressive for a game to pull that off because some developers still just say, you know what, we're going to have loading screens because this is how we have to approach our game. God of War took a slightly different approach in that they wanted it to be one continuous shot, so it never cuts away. So you always see Kratos, or you always try to see Kratos in angle or in view, but again, it always pans away if it needs to. It never has a direct cut. But either way, these games were principally based on not having any loading screens. And they both accomplished it in the same way 17 years apart, where they have long stretches of not doing anything until you get to this more unique area of the game. Jack and Daxter, a lot of walking. A lot of walking. A lot of doing those long jumps uh, so you can get to a place a little bit faster. But it's the same thing for God of War, except now you're in a canoe. You're doing a lot of boating <laughs> until you wind around those uh, corners, and then you finally get to that unique area that you've been looking for. Or if you do fast travel, Jack and Daxter actually was pretty quick with the fast travel there. Whereas in God of War, a bit more stretched out, right? You had this very, very overblown uh, situation where... You could go through this little realm door and run through this little picturesque section. Very beautiful. Again, you're moving Kratos around, but you're waiting to get to where you need to go up until the door finally shows up, which means, hey, your level has loaded, sir. Or the whole realm transfer with the, uh, the big tree there. Again, very beautiful looking. Looks fantastic. It's a great way to, to load the next uh, portion of the game. This is something you really have to think about. These are major decisions in game development that is not taken lightly. To make sure your whole project accounts for this aspect, to make sure the player never runs into that loading screen, and these are the things that developers have to do in order to get to that point, right? These are things that don't have to be thought about moving forward. In theory, a developer really doesn't have to think like this anymore 
where, okay, let's spend all this time, all this money, all these, all these resources into making this fast travel that doesn't make you sit there for upwards of a minute to even two minutes at a time, right? Anthem had really bad loading screens. Um, and people often say, you know, the bigger a game is, that's because of loading screens, but really it's also a bit reversed. The loading screens are a product of how great the game turns out to be. The sheer amount of assets that can be streamed into these worlds now is just incredible. It is such a massive jump from the slow seek times we had on HDDs. It really does allow for much more creative freedom. That's something that uh, I think people don't see here is that game designers, developers, it's like hardwired into them to account for these things. They know right away on a project, these are my limitations. They can't just go crazy. I mean, it's a creative process. They want to do these things. And this is where we go, come into the pitfalls of cut content, things that either, well, doesn't work out for a number of things unrelated to loading, like let's just say that like, this game plan mechanic's not fun or this environment just, just doesn't really work or it's not in the budget or we don't have enough time to do this. Of course, there's so many aspects. That's why we always say making games is just, it's a miracle that any game gets finished. But uh, many times it just comes down to the restraints. We can't bring in this much data this quickly. Another more quality of life thing that I think goes a long way is when your character dies, when you have to restart. This is something that could also be entirely eliminated. It goes a long way. I mean, it really depends on a number of factors. <clears throat> um, if you're restarting a level, if you're uh, restarting after a death, uh, if you, your character has to be brought up to a platform after they fall, that I think helps a lot, especially games that are a bit more repetitious, that, that features a lot of uh, faster dying, for example. You can see these things in smaller scale games. If you, if you play a lot of smaller scale titles or maybe uh, independent games, you can see games that don't have a heavy load on assets, and so they have a lot of very quick restarts. and. You can see how convenient that is. You can jump right into the action again, and it would be great to have this as a more streamlined thing on bigger budget titles. Now, we've mentioned how we can move away from arbitrary load screens, but what about new things? What does this really open up in terms of new game design? This is where I'd like to share a quote from the Chief Technology Innovation Officer at Rebellion Developments. He says, Finding new things to stream is an important part of this generation, and animation streaming is a game changer for motion capture. Now we can support detailed motion capture on a much wider scale like non-player characters simply doing their thing in the background. Instead of all the enemy NPCs moving in an identical way, for example, the SSD storage speed means we can offer many more unique motion captured animations. Having unique motion capture for NPCs sounds amazing, but also 10 times out of 10 on the chopping block for cut content because it's not within the storage budgets of that game. This is why SSDs are going to afford us an opportunity we haven't had for a very, very long time, where we have a game developed in 2018 that really hasn't changed all that much in terms of approach from a game developed in 2001. But as mentioned earlier, this is still very qualitative and that some people might not notice how much better their games have actually gotten. Some people didn't mind how developers dealt with it in the past, uh, hiding the loading screens or 30, 40 seconds to read a tip screen or even using that time to text somebody back. Some people didn't mind it, but then there's also the fact that, well, there's still gonna be fragmentation into next gen, right? It's not gonna be instant gratification on day one. Third parties are still gonna release on PS4 and Xbox One because of their large install base. This is very typical. Uh, they're gonna wanna wait for PS5 and Series X to grow a little bit until they you know, leave PS4 and Xbox One. Microsoft has already committed their first party to releasing on Xbox One and Series X for about a year and a half, two years. That's the typical amount of time. So uh, there's that. PlayStation 5, we might be just looking at Sony first party where if they're releasing strictly on PlayStation 5 and we are expecting pretty much most of Sony's worldwide studio to do that, they will more than likely be leveraging the full aspect of the SSD. And that is what I hopefully would like to see but even something where third parties uh, are three four years down the line where they've left ps4 and xbox one they may still mandate their pc versions to account for uh, pc configurations that have you know your traditional 5200 rpm drive so it'll be interesting to see how they deal with that as well will they start mandating ssds on pc but that they would also still have to be nvme ssds that's still a pretty high minimum to ask even three years down the road uh, you know it's a tough it's a tough sell Anyway, uh, that's about it, I think. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you haven't yet, please subscribe for the best PlayStation news, reviews, and updates that are here on YouTube. You can follow me on Twitter at Mystic Ryan. And that is it. I will see you all in my next video.
You take it easy.